Today, we're talking about bringing cultivated meat to market in the United States, and we will be hearing from experts on GFI science and technology policy and corporate engagement teams about this very timely topic. Uh, before we get started today, I do have just a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, for those of you that might be new to the work of GFI, we are an international nonprofit organization that is developing the roadmap for sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. So we identify the most effective solutions, we mobilize resources and talent, and we empower partners across the food system to make all proteins accessible, affordable, and most importantly, delicious. Uh, second of all, this seminar will be recorded and we will be posting this to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also be emailing all of you a copy of the recording and a copy of the slide deck that we're going through. So if you miss something, uh, no worries, we will be sending you a copy of everything. Um, third, we have allocated a bit more time today for audience Q&A. We'll have at least 30 minutes for questions. Um, so, but please just ask your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat. Uh, this just helps us keep track of them um, a bit more easily. And you're welcome to ask questions throughout the seminar, uh, but we will just be answering them at the end. And I also want to flag that we are hosting a virtual networking mixer on February 9th, um, and that's for folks in the cultivated meat industry. Uh, so we'll drop a link in the chat for anyone who would like to RSVP for that networking on February 9th. It's a lot of fun. Um, you're matched for one-on-one -on -one conversations, and you can really meet folks in the industry from all over the world. Um, with that, that's all the housekeeping today. So it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Um, our first presenter, Faraz Harsini, is a senior scientist of bioprocessing, um, GFI SciTech team. Um, and that's where he analyzes how to best scale the cultivated meat industry. Faraz holds a PhD in cell physiology and molecular biophysics. And prior to joining GFI, Faraz worked in biopharma as a protein expression and process development scientist. Today, Faraz will be providing an overview of the cultivated meat production process. Uh, next up, we will have Laura Braden, who is GFI's lead regulatory counsel and Maddie Cohen, who is GFI's senior regulatory attorney. Laura and Maddie work on domestic and global regulatory issues affecting cultivated meat and other alt proteins. Laura has a law degree from Harvard Law School, while Maddie holds a law degree from George Washington University, and both have a wealth of regulatory and litigation experience. Today, they will be covering the US regulatory pathway for cultivated meat. And then our last presenter, Emma Ignaszewski is the Associate Director of Industry Intelligence and Initiatives. Emma oversees our corporate engagement team's research and analysis initiatives, including our annual state of the industry reports, consumer insights, and market research. If you've read a GFI report, Emma's probably had a hand in it. And Emma previously worked in strategy, marketing, and communications, and she holds a bachelor's degree from Cornell University. And today she'll be providing an update on consumer insights and cultivated meat nomenclature. So we have an awesome group of experts here today. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Faraz, to kick things off for us. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to uh, walk you through the overall manufacturing process of cultivated meat, and we'll keep it pretty high level. And we'll go through the key aspects of cultivated meat bioprocessing. Next slide, please. So in general, there are four stages in cultivated meat manufacturing. Stage one is cell line development and cell banking. Stage two is proliferation scale up, differentiation and maturation. So proliferation only means that we are growing the cells in numbers. Differentiation means that when we have, for instance, a stem cell, we can induce a stem cell to become different types of cells, for instance, fat or muscle cells. And maturation in this context means that, uh, for instance, if you think about the complex uh, muscle structure, we start from single cells. Over time, these single cells fuse together and mature and form myofibers and myotubes and the overall hierarchy and complicated structure of muscle cells that you find typically. So that's called maturation. The third stage is harvesting. As the name suggests, that's harvesting the biomass or the tissue that we 
uh, produced in the sec uh, second stage. Uh, stage four is basically just end product formulation, manufacturing, and packaging. Next slide, please. So the process starts by uh, taking, uh, taking a sample uh, from the cells. So depending on what kind of meat we are interested in, whether it's fish, chicken, or pig, uh, the sample can, can come from the corresponding species. And the sample can be actually from either a blood sample, a tiny biopsy, or even from a tip of a feather. And the animal is not hurt beyond that. The sample that we collect will have different types of cells in it and a lot of other things that we are not interested in, such as connective tissue. So the first stage would be basically isolating the type of cells that we are interested in. So some companies work with fat tissue, some companies work with muscle tissue. So here is where we select and isolate these cells using different methods, such as cell sorting. And next, we establish a cell line from the cells that we are interested in working with. Um, the cell line characterization happens at this stage where we look at the growth rates, metabolism, safety, et cetera. Now, multiple cell lines may be established from the same origin, original sample. And cell lines are just like people, they're different. Some of them grow faster, some grow slower. So at this stage, it's very common that companies look at uh, different types of cell lines and find the best performing cell line to move forward. Next slide, please. The next step is cell banking. So once we have a working cell line, uh, cells are expanded from that stage and then allocated in tiny vials, generally one or two ml, and then they are frozen in liquid nitrogen and that produces our master cell bank. Then a vial from master cell bank is thawed, and then we expand it one more time and then aliquot it and freeze it once again. So this would produce our working cell bank. So all these aliquots come from the same uh, suspension of cells. So they are identical in any way that matters. And when I talk about cell bank, I don't know what you're like imagining, but it's not like your typical bank. It's basically a facility that holds um, uh, giant tanks of liquid nitrogen where cells are stored at. So every time that we start a new batch, we just go to a working cell bank, we grab one of these vials, thaw it and start a new batch. And we would never go back to the original animal uh, ever again. Next slide, please. So the second stage is cell proliferation, which is growing cells and producing the biomaterial that we are interested in. So the process starts by going to working cell bank, grabbing a vial, thawing it, and typically it starts with a shake flask. Then throughout the next uh, steps, we are just scaling up this process. Uh, this process is called seed train scaling up. So typically uh, what I'm showing here is something that is typically done, but it doesn't have to be necessarily this way. But typically we go from a shake flask to an intermediate bioreactor. Here I'm showing you a bioreactor called wave bioreactor or rocking bed. And the bioreactor that is sitting on top, it's a single use bioreactor bag, uh, which is typic uh, typical to be used. And from there we scale up, go to bioreactor vessels and eventually, um, we go to the largest bioreactor, uh, which is a production bioreactor. And here we just let cells grow to the maximum capacity before harvesting. Now you can imagine that the cells could be uh, just floating around as individual cells, uh, just in suspension, but also a lot of cells tend to aggregate and um, uh, produce cellular aggregates. Just note that when you have a bunch of cells aggregating and uh, growing on top of each other, the cells um, at the bottom or in the center will not have as much access to oxygen and nutrients. So they start dying. So these aggregates can't just grow indefinitely. Uh, to that, to, to let them grow faster, you may use things such as scaffolds or microcarriers. These are, you can think about them as tiny beads that produce some kind of surface for cells to adhere and grow on top of it. 
Next slide, please. So the next step is differentiation and maturation. This is not something that every company is working on, but a lot of them uh, will differentiate and measure cells using scaffolds or certain types of bioreactors. So here I'm showing you a hypothetical bioreactor with the scaffolds inside. So if you think about the normal physiology of muscles or any kind of cells, we have extracellular matrix that provides a structure for cells to adhere and grow. At the same time, it allows blood or oxygen and nutrients to pass through. So scaffolding does the same thing in bioreactors. Um, it also provides a structure for cells to grow in certain directions. Uh, and that's very important because if you look at the muscle physiology, you have directionality, you have hierarchy in terms of uh, how cells are structured. So scaffold will help us to get to the structure and texture that we are interested in. And the scaffold can be made through different methods. For instance, 3D printing. It can be made from edible or biodegradable material, uh, such as textured vegetable protein, uh, or even cellulose or mycelium. Uh, some companies even used material that can be uh, melted when uh, the product is cooked. So they provide a structure for cells to grow. And when you cook it, they just disappear and are edible. Next slide, please. So the third stage is harvest. So like I mentioned, if the cells are just in suspension, that would be basically centrifuging the cells, uh, spinning them down and harvesting the biomass. And if they are um, growing in a um, type of bioreactor that is meant for maturation or differentiation, different companies may use different ways to do that. But one way could be just to pressing the cells to remove the media and uh, a couple of washing steps may be involved in this process. Next slide, please. So the last stage is end product formulation, manufacturing, and packing. This stage is not that different from conventional meat processing. Uh, different things may happen here. For instance, spices may be added, or uh, the cultivated meat can be put in the form that the company is interested in. Um, you can expect that different types of meat have different structures, such as sausage, such as meatballs or steak, and some have more structure in them than others. So you can expect that earlier products be, be more similar to meatballs, and over time, uh, we can produce cells, um, meats that have higher structure and texture, such as bacon or steak. Um, and yeah, that's just the high level overview of biomanufacturing of cultivated meat. And with that, I pass it to Laura. Great, thank you so much for us. Hi everybody, I'm Laura Braden. I'm the lead regulatory counsel at GFI. And in the next part of this webinar, my colleague, senior regulatory attorney, Maddie Cohen and I are gonna collaborate to provide an overview of what the US regulatory process for cultivated meat looks like. This will include some new things that we've learned about the FDA's pre-market consultation process for cultivated meat um, when Upside Foods successfully completed that process for the first time in November. We'll touch on what some of the key next steps are and we'll provide a little bit of context on how the US regulatory system fits into global regulatory developments. Because we're discussing regulatory issues, I do wanna note that the information presented in this webinar is intended for general informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice or as a substitute for consulting with an attorney. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So starting with the basics, the two main US food regulatory agencies both play a role in regulating some cultivated meat products. The US Food and Drug Administration or FDA is part of the Department of Health and Human Services and has broad responsibility for protecting public health, including through ensuring the safety of the food supply. Part of the FDA's regulatory authority under the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act includes oversight of live animals intended to be used as human food up until the point of slaughter. The US Department of Agriculture is responsible for regulating pursuant to federal laws that relate to farming, forestry, and rural economic development. And the USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, or FSIS, 
has authority over the safety of food products derived from animals covered under two federal statutes, the Federal Meat Inspection Act or FMIA, which covers animals like cattle, sheep, swine, goats, and catfish, but not other types of fish, and the Poultry Products Inspection Act, which covers poultry, including chicken, turkeys, ducks, and geese. USDA FSIS oversees the slaughter and subsequent processing of animals falling under those statutes that are intended for human consumption, um, as well as the labeling of resulting food. Next slide. Uh, so back in March of 2019, FDA and USDA FSIS established a formal agreement under which they jointly oversee certain cultivated meat products. FDA oversees the initial stages of the cultivated meat production process, namely the cell collection, cell banking, and the growth and differentiation stages that Faraz just talked about for all human food made from cultivated animal cells. From the point of harvesting of the cultivated cell material, which agency has regulatory jurisdiction depends on the animal species that was used as the original source of the cells. So in cases where the original cell material came from an animal that the USDA regulates under the FMIA or the PPIA, regulatory authority passes from FDA to USDA at the point of harvest of cell material. USDA then oversees the further processing and labeling of the products. If the cell material came from a fish other than a catfish, then there is no jurisdictional transfer at the time of harvest. FDA retains sole regulatory jurisdiction over harvest, subsequent processing, and labeling. Next slide, please. So this slide just shows you visually how the U.S. approach for products derived from cells of animal species that are covered by the FMIA or the PPIA differs from the approach of most novel food frameworks outside of the U.S due to the jurisdictional transfer taking place at that harvest stage. Maddie will be touching briefly on some of those novel food frameworks outside of the US later in the presentation. Next slide. So in all cases, regardless of the animal from which the original cell material is obtained, the US regulatory process starts with the FDA. FDA's pre-market consultation process evaluates the safety of food made with cultivated animal cells before it enters the market. And FDA has stated that it intends to publish guidance for the industry on this pre-market consultation process. That guidance isn't available yet, so we don't know everything about what the agency will look for in future consultations. But because there is now a company that has successfully completed the consultation process, there is a lot more public information about what can be expected than there was a few months ago. A company seeking to manufacture and sell cultivated meat or seafood submits data and information documenting how and why it determined that its product is safe for human consumption. And FDA encourages companies to engage in conversations with it early and often as they are developing their product and their manufacturing processes. So a company submitting a full dossier of data and information is not gonna be the first step in the process. Companies should know that FDA has stated that it intends to publish all information about consultations other than proprietary company information that is protected by statute. So in the case of the Upside Foods pre-market consultation, nearly 100 pages of Upside's detailed submission was published upon FDA's completion of its review. FDA did also consider a confidential supplemental appendix with supporting corroborative information, um, including, for example, a complete list of the substances forming the cell culture media and components used in the production process. FDA evaluates the production process and the material made by the process, including cell line and cell bank establishment, all components and inputs and manufacturing controls. If the pre-market consultation is successful, FDA issues a letter stating that it has no questions about the company's food safety conclusion. FDA also stated that it did not identify any information indicating that the production process described in the submission would be expected to result in food that bears or contains any substance or microorganism that would adulterate the food. Next slide. Uh, this slide includes images that are from a really helpful info infographic that the FDA published at the time that it completed its first pre-market consultation process. It's um, helpful because it includes easy to understand language explaining what the FDA evaluated during that first completed pre-market consultation, as well as these Andy images. Um, so 
Notably, FDA evaluated the production process as well as the cell material that is produced. So at the cell collection phase, FDA review included how the cells were taken from an animal and confirmed to be from the correct species and what measures were taken to ensure that the cells were free from contaminants. At the cell line and cell bank stage where the cells are screened from the sample um, and grown to make a bank of cells, FDA re review included a review of quality control measures for the cell bank, including how cell identity was verified and how cell growth and behavior were measured. Um, at the next two stages, transfer and growth and differentiation, um, what, what uh, Faraz referred to as proliferation scale up and differentiation and maturation stages. Um, the FDA reviewed the substances that were used to support the growth and cell multiplication and to manage the properties of the medium itself, like pH, and reviewed how the company assessed the hazards at each production step and how it plans to apply food safety control measures as well as how it monitors the growth and health of the cell cultures during the process. At the harvest stage, where the material is harvested to prepare further through conventional food processing and packaging methods, the FDA review included review of the identity and composition of the harvested cell material and any potential residues from the, cult from the cultivating process. Next slide. A final thing to note about the completion of FDA's first pre-market consultation in November is that FDA established a new inventory for completed pre-market consultations. The inventory can be found on FDA's website. It's called the Human Food Made with Cultured Animal Cells Inventory. And it will include a specific set of information about any human food that has completed a pre-market consultation with FDA. That will be a description of the food and its species of origin, the company's final submission explaining its basis for concluding that the cell material is safe for use as human food, the FDA's letter in response, and the FDA's scientific memo documenting its evaluation of the submission. So currently there's just one item listed in this inventory, but we expect to see more in the future. Next slide. After successful completion of a pre-market consultation, aspects of the FDA's oversight are ongoing. For example, facilities that produce, process, pack, or hold cultivated meat for human consumption must register with the FDA, and each facility must be in compliance with the FDA's current good, good manufacturing practices and record keeping requirements. In accordance with generally applicable FDA regulations, food companies have to create and implement a written food safety plan for each facility that includes things like a hazard analysis, identifying potential biological, chemical, and physical hazards, and identification of preventative controls that address potential hazards such as food allergen, sanitation, and supply chain controls. Um, the food plan will also include oversight monitoring and verification procedures and a recall plan. Some smaller companies may qualify for modified food safety plan requirements. Ongoing routine inspections at cell banks and facilities where cells are cultured, differentiated, and harvested is also part of FDA's plan continuing oversight. FDA has said it will draw on the results of the pre-market consultation and a thorough assessment of records maintained by the facility in these ongoing routine inspections in order to ensure that potential risks are being managed and biological material exiting the culture process is safe and not adulterated. With that, I'm gonna pass things along to Maddie to touch on the USDA side of the regulatory process as well as labeling. Thanks, Laura. Uh, as Laura mentioned, USDA FSIS will oversee the processing, packaging, and labeling of cultivated terrestrial meat, poultry, and catfish products from the point of harvest on. So I'll explain a bit of what that oversight looks like. So first, before any of these products under USDA's jurisdiction can be produced either for transportation or for sale, companies need to obtain what's called a grant of inspection from USDA for each facility where these products will be produced. And in order to obtain a grant of inspection, USDA will come and conduct an on-site review of the facility and verify that it's in compliance with all applicable regulatory requirements. In general, these cultivated meat production facilities are going to need to meet the same regulatory requirements that already apply to conventional meat processing and packing facilities other than those that are related to slaughter. So those requirements include things like facility construction specifications, 
written sanitation standard operating procedures, HACCP plans, written recall procedures, and various record keeping requirements. Once F uh, USDA grants the company and the facility inspection, then FSIS inspection personnel will conduct inspections at each facility at least once per operating shift, which is the same inspection rate that's currently required for conventional meat processing facilities. Um, and FSIS has recently announced that it will be publishing an internal directive that provides inspection program staff with instructions on the inspection verification procedures at facilities that harvest or process cultivated meat. Um, I do want to note that directives are not regulations or guidance. They're not really meant to provide information to industry. They're internal instructions for FSIS personnel. Um, but the directive will be made public on USDA's website, and it might provide some useful information about how cultivated meat inspections will be conducted. In terms of how cultivated meat will be labeled, uh, as part of their agreement to jointly regulate cultivated meat, FDA and USDA have agreed to develop their labeling principles jointly for their products under their respective jurisdictions in order to avoid confusion and ensure some harmonization between the way that seafood FDA regulates is labeled and the products that USDA regulates are labeled. Um, both agencies have already gathered public comments on the labeling of cultivated meat, but neither has released any sort of guidance rules or regulations yet. FSAS did recently add a notice of proposed rulemaking on labeling of cultivated meat products under its jurisdiction to um, the federal government's unified regulatory agenda, which means that it may issue uh, proposed rules for labeling cultivated meat later this year. In the meantime, uh, FSIS will pre-approve cultivated meat labels on a case-by-case -case basis, which means companies don't need to wait for labeling regulations to be finalized and published in order to submit their label to USDA for pre-approval if they are ready to go to market. Next slide. Um, looking at some other countries that have made significant progress on cultivated meat regulation, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, Singapore remains the only country with fully approved cultivated meat products on the market. The Singapore Food Agency, or SFA, first approved Good Meats cultivated chicken back in 2020 and has since approved several more of the company's chicken products. Uh, and earlier this month, they also approved the use of serum-free media in the production of Good Meats products. SFA has also granted uh, a scientific manufacturing firm called Isco Aster a license to manufacture cultivated meat products in Singapore from cells that have already gone through SFA's um, safety assessment process. And this is something that will give cultivated meat companies the option to produce their products in a facility that's already been approved by the regulator once they have their own cells approved. And one thing that's very helpful in Singapore is that the SFA has published a written framework for its novel food safety assessments, which includes a dedicated section on its cultivated meat assessments. And the agency regularly updates this document and makes it available on its website. So companies have access to the most up-to-date information about what SFA is looking for. Um, and it was most recently updated in September, 2022. Next slide. Beyond the US and Singapore, there are a bunch of other countries that could potentially be next in line for commercialization of cultivated meat. So I'll just mention a few here. In Australia and New Zealand, the food regulatory agency FSANS has announced that its food regulatory system is already equipped to deal with cultivated meat under the country's existing novel food standard. Under that standard, companies do need to seek pre-approval from FSANS, and they'll submit an application similar to the process in Singapore for pre-market approval. And Australia and New Zealand also have some specific regulations that govern GM foods that might apply to cultivated meat products if they rely on certain GM technology. But companies don't need to wait for any new regulations in Australia and New Zealand before seeking approval there. 
Japan is also in an interesting position. Um, based on some interpretations of Japanese law, it may already be permissible to sell cultivated meat in Japan, depending on the growth factors and the cells used in that production process. But it does look like Japan might intend to set up a specific regulatory framework for cultivated meat. Earlier this year, the government announced that the Health, Labor, and Welfare Ministry will be putting together a team of subject matter experts that are going to review the food safety aspects of cultivated meat and um, try to determine best options for the country to regulate cultivated meat. And even before the government started acting, um, Japan has kind of grown a robust network of thought leaders in the area of cultivated meat and specifically regulation. A think tank called the Japanese Center for Rulemaking Strategy has put together two groups, uh, the Cellular Agriculture Study Group, which includes industry, academics, and other experts who are making policy recommendations to the government, and then also the Japan Association for Cellular Agriculture, which is a public-private partnership that's working in part to develop regulations for cell-based foods, including cultivated meat. And then the UK is another place where we may see new regulations governing cultivated meat. When the UK left the European Union, it retained the EU's novel food regulation and the EU's regulation governing GM foods. So as of now, the regulatory process in the UK is very similar to that in the EU. Cultivated meat products would require pre-market authorization. Companies would need to apply to the UK Food Standards Agency, or FSA, they need to go um, under a lengthy assessment similar to that that's currently conducted by the European Food Safety Authority in the EU. But in 2022, the FSA launched a review of the UK's novel food regulation, and the purpose of the review is to identify and evaluate a variety of potentially uh, of potential regulatory models for novel foods in the UK. So we may actually see a new system for evaluating cultivated meat and other novel products in the UK in coming years. And, and the last item that I wanted to mention as we look at the global regulatory landscape is um, that the UN Food and Agriculture Organization conducted an expert consultation on the food safety aspects of cell-based foods um, in conjunction with the World Health Organization back in November. And they plan to publish the results of that convening in a document that's going to help provide regulators around the world with the most up-to-date technical information and best practices related to the food safety aspects of cultivated meat, which should help regulators um, kind of globally understand these issues better as they think about um, the best regulatory models to use in their respective countries. And that document is expected to be published um, in the first half of 2023. And I will hand it over to Emma to talk about Consumer Insights. Thank you, Maddie, and hello, everyone. Next, we're going to highlight some key consumer insights on the topic of cultivated meat. And I'll start with the important note that consumer research on cultivated meat products is being performed largely in a pre-launch environment. So it's our expectation that as products come to market and consumers become more familiar with the concept and also with the experience of eating cultivated meat, that the results of consumer surveys and testing, particularly familiarity and consumer understanding, can improve in cultivated meat's favor. So first off, let's look at some of the concerns consumers have about the current way meat is produced via industrial animal agriculture. GFI commissioned new consumer research from Embold Research this past December that showed that consumers select the rising cost of meat and the overuse of antibiotics as their top two concerns about conventional meat production. Concerns about cost underscore the importance of alternative proteins eventually costing the same as or less than conventional meat. So cost reduction is a topic that the cultivated meat industry and the academic community are researching considerably, but there are many opportunities to expand that research with the help of both public and private funding. At the same time, the research found that some of the largest concerns with cultivated meat are the idea of unknown risks, which indicated that more consumer education can continue to improve openness to the category cost was another concerning factor for consumers. 
And indeed, we've seen from previous research in both the US and the UK that after cultivated meat technology is explained to consumers, in this case via an explanation of the cell culture process, the qualities of the product, and a brief explanation of the social, public health, and environmental benefits, that consumer support for cultivated meat increases. So the effect of this consumer education is even higher for groups who report being very or extremely willing to try cultivated meat. And then in GFI's recent study, we also broke down components of potential explanations of cultivated meat to understand which components were the most appealing. Respondents found most appealing the affirmations of cultivated meat's sensory characteristics. In other words, how it looks, cooks, and tastes, and how it is essentially the same as typical conventional meat types. We also tested the appeal of different messaging on the various benefits of cultivated meat. The health message was the most appealing message. It included content on how cultivated meat can be grown without added hormones, steroids, or antibiotics in facilities with cleaner conditions than those for conventional meat processing, and that this reduces the risk of both foodborne illnesses and future pandemics. This indicates that health messaging can be part of the toolbox when performing consumer education or marketing around cultivated meat. Messages on climate change, environmental benefits, the taste and eating experience, and food security were the next most appealing messages, and it could be worth exploring which aspects of those messages are most effective. So, will consumers try cultivated meat? There is a strong indication that they will. After cultivated meat was described to respondents, we found that 45% stated they'd be likely to try cultivated meat, followed by 23% who would buy it. This underscores the importance of efforts to effectively market products and provide consumer education. We also noted that few consumers report a willingness to pay more for cultivated meat than for conventional meat, which again emphasizes just how critical it is for the industry to make progress towards price parity. When asked explicitly about reasons for their interest in trying cultivated meat, respondents actually identified curiosity and novelty as their top motivator, followed by environmental reasons, animal welfare, and global food security. The GFI and Embold research also explored current consumer perceptions about the terminology used to describe cell culture for meat production. And I'll step back briefly when discussing which terms are best for describing this sector from an industry perspective, there are several considerations that are important. Terms should differentiate between existing products like conventional meat or plant-based meat and the new product, which is also important to regulators. Terms should be descriptive and help consumers understand what the product is. Terms should be brief and easily printed on labels. They should appeal to consumers and not be unfairly biased in ways that would lead to low appeal. And terms should also be accurate descriptions of the product. It's also critical to keep in mind Again, that consumer familiarity with these products is currently very low, as very few consumers have had direct experiences with them. Consumer understanding has a large opportunity to improve further upon product availability in grocery stores and in restaurants. GFI has analyzed terms that are in use by companies in the sector in recent years, and it's clear that cultivated meat has risen to the top by a wide margin while cultured, cell cultured, and cell based have the same or lower use today when compared to in 2020. This has paralleled a rise in cultivated meats use in social contexts, in news articles, and online. In our new research, when consumers were asked how effective different terms are at distinguishing between this type of meat and conventional meat, Cultivated meat and cell cultured meat performed similar, similarly to each other and better than other terms. We'll note that overall, there is still ample room for consumer education on the distinction between this product category and conventional meat. In terms of accuracy and brevity, an analysis of terms suggests that cultivated meat and cell cultivated meat rise to the top. At this point, terms like lab grown meat are inaccurate as at scale, the production process occurs in a production facility that is similar to a brewery rather than a lab. 
And then cell-based meat is accurate, but could lead to confusion as all other production types have products that also contain cells like animal-based meat and plant-based meat. GFI and Embold research found that cultivated meat was the most appealing term to consumers, but that all terms scored much more highly on unappealing than on appealing, again, highlighting a need for category positioning and consumer education. One demographic highlight is that 18 to 34 year olds were even more likely to find cultivated meat to be an appealing term, indicating the openness of younger consumers to the category. While familiarity with this product is still understandably low overall, cultivated meat was second only to the sensational term lab-grown meat on familiarity. People of color and younger respondents were even more likely to report having heard of cultivated meat. And I'll note again that we expect consumer familiarity on cultivated meat to further improve as products come to market. When asked directly which terms respondents could imagine using personally, Cultivated meat was second only again to lab-grown meat, and notably a close second given the wide use of the lab-grown meat term as a sensational term in the media. When asked which terms they would be comfortable seeing on an ingredient list on food packaging, respondents selected cultivated meat as the top term. Overall, we believe this research supports the continued use of cultivated meat by the industry. This term offers the strongest combination of accuracy, ability to differentiate and direct consumer preference. And now I'll pass it back to Audrey. Thank you so much, Emma and everyone for a great presentation. Um, I know I always learn a lot. We have quite a bit of time uh, left for Q&A um, and there have been so many questions flowing in through the chat, um, through the Q&A box. Please keep those questions coming. Um, but just another reminder, please ask them in the Q&A box. That just really helps us monitor and track them so we can answer as many as we can. Um, to start off with today, uh, Faraz, I'm going to ask you some questions um, about the scientific process for cultivated meat that came in, um, just so everyone has that same baseline understanding. Um, and our first question for you, Faraz, is, why use scaffolding and why differentiate the cells? So like I mentioned earlier, um, <clears throat> with cultivated meat, you can just simply think that we are replicating what happens in the uh, cow's body. Uh, typically when you have uh, normal cells growing in the body, you have extracellular matrix. These are structures that provide, it's like a skeleton for cells to adhere. And then there is spaces in between where your blood can flow, uh, it can deliver nutrients, it can deliver oxygen. So you can imagine that without scaffolding, without uh, providing this structure, um, all the cells will just grow on top of each other. And um, like I mentioned, in this scenario, a lot of cells in the bottom or in the center of this mass start dying. So in order to let um, cells uh, grow um, to become a tissue, so from just having, from going from like a cell suspension to producing tissue, we need some kind of structure. And that's what scaffolding does. And in terms of uh, differentiation, um, a lot of times the process starts from a stem cell. Some companies, again, decide to induce these stem cells to become fat tissue or uh, muscle tissue. So these are all parameters that we can control and decide at what stage we want to differentiate or mature cells if you want to go that route. Thanks, Raz. The next question here, um, they're asking, does the specific source animal at the beginning of the process make a difference in the final product quality, um, or are these cells fairly generic within species? There is certainly a huge difference uh, between species, so there's no question in that, especially when you go from fish to uh, red meat, etc. But also within uh, species, there is variability, uh, especially if you think about uh, each herd of uh, animals that are bred differently, uh, they are bred for different purposes. And there is also a degree of individual variability um, between animals of the same, uh, within the same herd. So it is of course expected to see some variation in between. Uh, so it is important where the source um, is and what the source is. 
Um, but what I can also add is that uh, a lot of times these are from animals that um, have gone through a lot of uh, processing by vets to um, make sure that the origin of animal is very well established and uh, etc. Right. And after those biopsies are taken, can the animals live out the rest of their lives um, happily or what happens to the animal after the biopsy? Yeah, I guess that's a, that's a whole point of cultivated meat. So in addition to have um, products that are better for the environment and uh, global world hunger and many other aspects, one of them is, of course, to have um, better animal welfare uh, conditions. And one of them is to actually let animals live. So um, certainly for the future, um, animals are not hurt beyond uh, taking the biopsy or even now. And just remember, sometimes the, uh, the original sample can actually come from just the chicken egg. Um, so of course, yeah, they can be uh, free afterwards and it would not be possible for cultivated meat if every time that you wanted to start a batch, if, if you wanted to go to the original animal, it, it just would not work that way. So the whole idea is to take the sample, start your master cell bank, working cell bank, and every time you need a new batch, you just go to your liquid nitrogen tank and not to the animal ever again. Thanks, Raz. And what do we have any updated timelines um, or estimates on achieving cost parity with animal equivalents? So yeah, I knew it was coming. Uh, it is very difficult to uh, give a good estimate, but we can expect that within this decade, uh, a lot of companies are uh, scaling up. So after that, we can have a much better idea of when this is gonna happen. But um, while there are degrees of uncertainty, uh, we can expect that by the end of this decade or so, uh, cultivated meat products can reach parity with at least luxury uh, products. Exactly. And on that scale up question, what companies do you see as being best placed to meet future demand for bioreactors at scale? Do you think this will be incumbents um, who are already producing bioreactors for other processes? Um, do you see startups coming in to fill this scale up gap? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, especially because developing better bioreactors is going to be crucial for scaling up cultivated meat. And just to be clear, scaling up by itself is not a problem. Scaling up for cultivated meat in a setting that is different from pharmaceuticals and making it as cheap as possible, that is the problem, not just scaling up itself. But yes, there are companies that are famous for producing high quality bioreactors such as Merck, uh, uh, Sartorius, Eppendorf, and some of these companies are jumping in um, to um, produce better bioreactors for cultivated meat, but it also uh, cultivated meat area has provided an opportunity for startups to um, produce bioreactors or design bioreactors for the specific purpose of cultivated meat, such as Arc Biotech. Thank you. And one more question for you, Faraz, before we uh, hop over to some of our policy questions that we're getting. We have a few questions here around um, how important is it to completely sterilize the growth media, so really eliminating any foreign bacteria. And then a related question is around um, if there's any information released publicly about the background or expected levels of organisms and cultivated meat products. Is the expectation that these will be less contaminated when they're packaged um, because they're not going through that traditional slaughter process? Um, could there be greater risk of contamination from opportunistic pathogens during processing or packaging? Um, yeah, uh, good questions. Hopefully I remember them in that order. But um, uh, yes, the media by itself has to be sterilized. There are different ways to do that, such as uh, irradiation or uh, filtering. Um, Sterilizing the media by itself is not as difficult as keeping the entire process sterilized. Um, and it's also is not as costly as the entire process. So uh, sterilizing the media is pretty typical and I don't see that as being um, a huge problem. And if you do that, then you're getting rid of uh, any um, 
uh, kind of microorganism that can cause any issue at that step. Uh, in terms of possible contaminations, as uh, I think it was stated in the question, it is expected that cultivated meat uh, would be much cleaner in terms of contaminants that uh, you usually find, you can usually find in during like slaughtering process. Um, but the question I think was, can we expect new opportunities for like opportunistic microorganisms to grow? This is actually a very good question. I'm working on a bioprocessing survey and this is a question that we are asking companies to see if they are expecting anything like that. But so far I can say that because the entire process has to be um, uh, sterile uh, and just think about yeast and bacteria, they can grow really fast. So if there is any contamination, regardless of these uh, microorganisms be pathogenic or not, uh, they're gonna take over the sample really quickly. So it just doesn't make any sense for any kind of microorganism besides the cells that you're working with to be present. So, um, but whether, if, whether there is specific threats for cultivated meat or not, like new uh, pathogens that can be in induced um, we don't know that yet, but it's unlikely. We're asking companies though. Thanks, Raz. And just a, a quick plug to any companies in the audience, please uh, participate in our bioprocessing survey. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, moving on to some of our policy and regulatory questions uh, for Laura and Maddie. Um, we had a few questions about fish and about catfish. Um, could you dig into that a little bit more? I think there was some confusion around um, how fish is regulated a bit differently than maybe meat and then how catfish fits into all of this. Yeah, I'll jump in on that, um, Audrey, because I think I might have inadvertently caused that confusion. Sorry about that. Um, so FDA generally has jurisdiction over, um, over foods, except for those specifically assigned to USDA through the statutes that I mentioned. Um, cat, so fish, seafood in general, falls under FDA's sole jurisdiction. Um, catfish is an exception that, that is regulated by USDA. And that is for, I think, historical reasons having to do with some trade disputes between the US and other countries um, with respect to catfish in particular. So other seafood is, is FDA only and catfish with respect to cultivated um, products falls into that joint regulatory framework that we discussed. Thank you. And uh, this is a question I think everyone at GFI gets a lot. Um, someone's wondering besides Upside, how many other companies do we think are near FDA approval? Do you think we will get more than one company commercially selling cultivated meat in the US this year? Anything we can say on this? This is always a really tough one to answer. Um, I think we can say that that seems like a possibility given the regulatory landscape, but I don't know numerically how many that might be. Indeed. And then shifting gears a little bit, we have um, a few questions here around the nutritional value of these products. Um, curious if there's information about the nutritional value that's been approved by the FDA. Um, do they share how much protein, fat, other nutrients are in cultivated meat? So um, with respect to the Upside Foods product that successfully completed the pre-market consultation process, I can't speak to any of the details off the top of my head, but I do know that there is certainly nutrition information in the submission that Upside provided to FDA, including some comparisons with cultivated, I'm sorry, with conventional chicken. Um, and some of that information is also summarized in the FDA's memo scientific memorandum outlining what it evaluated in the course of the consultation. So the answer is yes. Thank you. And do you know if the FDA or USDA will require post-market health studies on consumers who are regularly eating cultivated meat? There's no indication that that's gonna be required. That's not a, a typical thing for the agencies to do, but I'm aware of. Got it. Um, 
And then we have some questions here around if there is consideration for designer cultivated meat um, where multiple types of animal cells might be available in one product. Um, maybe we're combining beef muscle tissue with duck fat. Um, can different cells like pork and beef be combined? Uh, I will open this up to anyone uh, to answer. Um, I mean, I don't know if you have specific thoughts for us on the actual process of doing that. I think from a regulatory standpoint, you know, all of the cells involved would need to undergo the evaluation process and then USDA and FDA would have to work together to label any products if they were going to fall under both, um, both of those agencies' jurisdictions. Thanks, Maddie. Um, and then there's a, a, a self-acknowledged weird question. Um, any talks in the industry regarding cultivated human cells? And I will say there is um, nothing that I have heard about cultivated human cells as of yet. Um, but moving on, um, does the FDA want uh, GMP standards for food production? Does the USDA want that as well? Uh, Maddie, I'll let you answer that one. Yeah, so FDA's um, current good manufacturing processes do apply to all foods. So as part of the requirement that any facility that um, holds, packs, or processes, or transports food for human consumption has to be registered with FDA and has to follow um, the current good manufacturing processes. Um, and then USDA, in addition, requires a written hazard analysis and critical control points or HACCP plan uh, for all of the facilities that it will um, inspect. Thank you. And Laura, I'll direct this next question towards you. Uh, what is the expected timeline on the FDA process and approval? Has the FDA put out any target timelines? Um, there's, there's not a target timeline that FDA has put out. Um, insofar as this question refers to the pre-market consultation process specifically, um, we can just see from the information that's been made public that Upside Foods submitted its full dossier about 13 months before um, FDA issued its letter. Now, that doesn't mean that that was when the process started. This was, of course, the first time a company went through this process successfully. And um, I, I saw a recent press article where Upside Foods um, CEO stated that they started working with FDA several years before that. I think that as both um, the industry matures and FDA gets more experience with these products, I would think that that overall time frame would, would shrink. Absolutely, one can hope. Um, and just a related question on if there's any indication of how long the regulatory process takes for other government entities to get final approval for new technologies like cultivated meat. So looking globally, uh, what does this approval process look like? Maddie, maybe you have some thoughts to share on this one. Yeah, I mean, for cultivated meat specifically, obviously the only country we have to look at right now is Singapore, and it's generally taken about nine to 12 months there once the agency has all of the required information. So um, somewhat similar to the timeline that it took for the upside consultation. Um, other countries really vary based on other novel foods. Um, the EU notably can take quite a long time. It can take about 15 months to, to three years for novel foods there, but there have not been any cultivated meat dossiers submitted to um, the EU regulator yet. So we just don't know there or, or in other countries. Got it, thank you. And um, again, another maybe related question here, um, is this person is, is asking this uh, from the UK and they're curious about what the legal basis is for describing cultivated meat as meat, um, saying that they have sought legal advice on this and have been advised that it cannot be considered to be meat, um, which causes potential issues with marketing and labeling. Um, is there any info that we have around regulations in the UK as it, comes, as it regards cultivated meat? It really varies from, from country to country. It's gonna to have to do with what laws and regulations are already in place. 
Um, so yeah, I definitely think that's something where getting the advice of um, a UK attorney is, is your best bet. Great. And um, I'm just doing a quick time check right now. So it is uh, 10 a.m. my time here on the West Coast. Uh, we do have another 30 minutes allocated for Q&A. Uh, we have a lot of questions to get through. So encourage everyone to continue to stay on um, as we dig into some of these topics. Um, so, so moving on, uh, this is another question for you, Maddie. Um, just regarding the speed of regulation and legislation, do you think it's advantageous for cultivated meat to fit into current regulatory models? Um, examples with Australia and New Zealand, um, or there are new regulatory frameworks more favorable for cultivated meat. Um, and kind of related, would GFI like to see more cultivated meat specific regulation, or would we prefer that cultivated meat fit into previous regulation for faster time to market? The answer to that really is it depends. It depends on the regulatory framework. You know, some of these novel frameworks have been updated somewhat recently and the way they work could easily fit a product like cultivated meat through their process. Um, they could do something like what Singapore did where they've got a novel foods process, but they have specific guidelines for cultivated meat. Um, and in other countries where maybe they're, they don't have these processes in place yet, it would make more sense to have new regulations that are specific to these products. Um, but I think in either case, what's really most important to see from global regulators is transparency. If they're going to use existing regulatory systems, it's really helpful if they make that clear, if they make that official so that companies know that they can go through those existing systems um, and to provide as much information as possible on what they need to see from companies in order to authorize these products. Thank you, Maddie. Um, I'm going to hop over to you, Emma. We have a lot of questions left um, on the policy side, but I do want to ask some of these other questions and we can we can loop back. Um, and so, Emma, we have a question here around if if you see more potential in precision fermentation versus cultivated meat going forward. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. So both of these production types offer the food industry incredible potential to deliver great tasting products that match the taste, texture, appearance, and preparation experience of conventional products. Uh, one additional concept that we are excited about at GFI is the potential for hybrid products, especially in the near term. So given that the primary barrier to consumers eating current plant-based meat alternatives today is the sensory gap, is the sensory gap that means it's sort of possible that in this nascent stage of cultivated or precision fermentation and enabled production for alternative proteins, that single ingredients like a cultivated fat ingredient or a precision fermentation enabled protein could help elevate the sensory profiles of otherwise plant-based products to improve consumer adoption. Thanks, Emma. And uh, digging into some of the questions that we asked, um, Someone's wondering, was curiosity and novelty the most common or the highest ranked answer for reasons to try cultivated meat? Yeah, that's a good point of clarification. So the phrasing of the question to respondents was, why are you interested in trying cultivated meat when it becomes available to consumers? And they could select all of the different um, sort of attributes that applied. And so 65% of, of respondents selected curiosity slash novelty, 51% selected environmental reasons, that same amount, 51% selected animal welfare, 44% selected global food security, 23% selected health reasons, and then 5% selected something else. Thank you for clarifying and adding that detail there. And was willingness to pay, was this measured with real incentives, real food? Can you dig into that a bit more? Yeah, sure. So we looked at willingness to pay um, in this study from an explicit question where we ask consumers, you know, are you willing to try? Or how likely are you? How likely are you to try? How likely are you to purchase this? How likely are you willing to pay more for cultivated meat than for a conventional product? 
Um, we recognize that that is a less dependable method than performing implicit or practical tests of this concept. And that's one of the reasons why we're so excited for products to come to market is that you know, there will be more opportunities to test real time and in action consumer willingness to pay and willingness to adopt. Thank you. And uh, this question keeps coming up, but Emma, you might have a little bit of a different take or more to add. Do you have anything to expand on in regarding to the price parity conversation? Yeah, it's a really complex question. We have heard from some companies, obviously, that they've brought costs to produce per pound down significantly. However, there are a large variety of price points in the conventional meat market to begin with, and many of the cultivated meat companies producing today have facilities at the pilot or the demo scale, which are producing, you know, maybe tens or hundreds or thousands of metric tons, rather than at that industrial scale, which is more, you know, the golden the the um the holy grail of scaling which would involve production of millions of metric tons so we've seen that estimate from bcg and blue horizon that cultivated meat in some categories could reach price parity by 2032 but i'll reiterate that 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 depends largely on category and product type so for example a chicken nugget versus a whole cut that requires a complex structure um, will have a, a large bearing on the industry's ability to reach price parity. Absolutely. And um, related to price parity and Faraz, I'm going to call on you um, to have some thoughts on this. Uh, growth factor costs are obviously a huge part of the expense of cultivated meat production. What progress has been made in reducing growth factor costs? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, GFI actually uh, just published a uh, an analysis on that, so I will put the link uh, here shortly after I'm done. Uh, but there's been a lot of progress um, in terms of recombinant uh, protein production. Uh, we know that albumin is one of the proteins that um, uh, is very essential in replacement as a recombinant protein. Um, the question more than uh, just the cost is also the scale that we need to produce these proteins, and that's still a challenge. Um, but I think that's a challenge that I'm very optimistic that we can uh, overcome. Thanks, Raz. And going back to you, Emma, um, in your prior response, you mentioned producing millions of metric tons of cultivated meat. And so with that, do we have a sense about where incumbent meat companies sit on cultivated meat? Are they supportive? Do they see this as a new opportunity or are they lobbying heavily against this new technology on the regulatory side to slow down this process? Sure. So we've definitely seen that the all of each of the largest six meat companies in the world have been involved in alternative proteins in some way, whether it's via investment in startups um, or starting their own product lines, mostly in plant-based um, or in acquiring acquiring companies. And, you know, one highlight on the cultivated meat front is that JBS, the largest meat company in, in the world, acquired a Spanish cultivated meat startup called Biotech. And JBS has also announced the establishment of an R&D center. Um, and in fact, JBS said in late 2021 that it plans to bring cultivated meat to market by 2024. Thanks, Emma. And one last question for you. Um, do consumers know that the future of cultivated meat um, will likely include uh, plant-based ingredients um, within the cultivated meat product? Do we know how consumers feel about that? Yeah, so I'd reiterate that consumers today are largely unaware of the specifics of the concept of cultivated meat and that these products will come to market first, uh, likely in combination with plant proteins. So companies should definitely be clear and transparent about the composition of, of products on their pack and in marketing so that consumers can understand what these products are. I'll also note that one of the benefits of these hybrid plant-based and cultivated products is that they can take advantage of the benefits um, and consumer positive consumer perceptions of plant-based products, right? That they offer them certain um, health health benefits like fiber or lower cholesterol, for example, um, and that some of these early products can then sort of offer a, a um, 
dual benefit of having that sort of genuine taste and texture of a, of a conventional product, but also some of the benefits that are driving the plant-based movement. Great, thanks Emma. I'm seeing another question in here uh, asking about um, if we're doing cultivated meat for pet foods, uh, and I can take that one. We know of three companies at least, uh, Bond Pet Food, Because Animals, and Wild Earth, who are all developing cultivated meat products for pets. Um, I believe Wild Earth just did a uh, small launch of, of their product recently. Um, but those are the three we know of. If you know of any more, please add them to GFI's company database. Uh, we'd love to learn about new companies working on that. And then moving on um, back to some questions for Maddie and Laura. Um, are there any FDA or USDA regulatory comments on ingredients used in cultivated meat um, from downstream to upstream processing? So when it comes to the scaffolding, media, serum, et cetera, um, what, what, what's going on with FDA and USDA about those ingredients? Um, sure, I can try to answer that. I'm not entirely sure. Um what this question is, is getting at. There aren't planned FDA or USDA regulations that we know of on the composition or food safety considerations for particular ingredients, if that's what's being asked. Um, and I believe these issues are likely to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis through the pre-market consultation process, at least for now. Got it. And um, kind of building off of that, then would you recommend enabling technology companies maybe who are making those scaffolds, making that growth media, um, would you suggest that they apply for regulatory approval for that ingredient separately from the overall process? Um, I think that that is definitely something that companies like that should talk to FDA directly about. Um, we, we haven't seen that happen thus far, but um, FDA has been quite engaged with the industry and I would expect they'd be willing and happy to answer questions about that. Thanks. And um, this is a question I'll offer up to, to everyone. Uh, is it by chance that chicken was first was chosen first for FDA approval? Um, is fish more simple to produce than chicken um, or beef? Um, are the next approvals uh, that we should expect also be chicken based? Or do you think that they'll go on to approve different kinds of meat or fish? I don't, I don't know from a scientific perspective whether um, Faraz or others think that is by chance, but I, but I think but I think from a regulatory perspective, it's not predictive that the, the fact that the first um, product to complete the pre-market consultation process was chicken uh, doesn't mean that the next one will be. Yeah, and uh, they are very different in terms of um, manufacturing, and I think um, part of it is also what's uh, uh, where the market uh, where, where there is like a need in market for it so it could be chicken a lot of times and uh, especially because there is a lot of startups another uh, thing is that when a new company comes in they have to find a product that no one else is working on so that's another uh, motivation for people to work on different products which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with how simple it is to produce that particular product, whether it's fish or chicken. But I would say that seafood is not by any means like that much easier than just making red meat. Thanks, Raz. Uh, switching gears a bit, um, in the United States, are veterinarians involved in the cultivated meat process? Um, are they involved specifically with the cell collection process with live animals and doing those biopsies? Raz, maybe you have some thoughts on that. Yes, that is correct. Um, especially when the cells are harvested, it's generally either in the presence of a vet or um, certainly the animals uh, already have gone through uh, uh, screening by a vet, uh, which is actually very important. The selection of that first animal, making sure we know the exact history of that animal and we... Um, know that the, the animal is completely safe and there is no diseases, that's actually very important. So yes, of course, vets are involved in that process. Thanks, Raz. Um, 
And then we have a few other questions, I think, for you, Faraz. Uh, this one's asking about cultivated dairy. Um, is cultivated dairy a different process than cultivated meat? Can you talk about those distinctions there? Uh, yes, yeah, so with cultivated dairy, um, the cells that are harvested and put in culture, or mammary gland uh, cells that produce uh, the basically lactate. So I think the uh, process would be very much different than growing meat because in this case you are just, um, I would say it's more uh, closer to uh, current processes in pharmaceutical companies where we have uh, for instance, Cho cell lines or other types of cells that we grow a lot. And then we just uh, have these cells produce something and then uh, isolate that uh, material from the batch. So in this case, we are not interested in just uh, proliferating cells and just making tissue necessarily, tissue or biomass. We are interested in the products. So it's expected the pro for the process to be very different. Got it. And um... Laura and Maddie, do you have any sense of if the regulatory process will be different for something like a cultivated dairy product, or is that still unknown? I mean, I don't think it should be significantly different given that the way that the um, agencies have titled the work they're doing is um, food for human consumption come, coming from cultured animal cells, not cultivated meat specifically. So the work they're doing now should be broad enough to cover something like cultivated dairy, but I don't think we know entirely yet just because that's, we're not there yet. Got it. Thank you. And uh, Faraz, another question for you here. Do you think that the future is possible without the need for FBS, needle bovine serum? Yes. Uh, well, I'm happy to say it's not really the future. It's already happening because um, for none of the cultivated meat companies, it would be practical to use FBS. Um, there are ethical concerns, but in addition to that, the uh, supply for FBS is very limited uh, globally. So, um, and I'm also happy to say that might be something that you don't hear often, but using FPS even in biopharma is a huge problem. So it's in everyone's best interest to come up with best, uh, better alternatives, including uh, manufacturers of uh, media. So that's why big companies, big biotech companies are also trying to find um, cost-effective, well-defined, chemically defined alternatives for FPS, but yes, uh, we don't have a lot of information about what cultivated meat companies are using because of um, IP matters, but we know that um, uh, almost none of them is using FPS already, and it just would not be practical. So yes, there are plant-based alternatives. There are um, recombinant proteins that can be added to chemically defined media and many other substitutes. Well, that is very exciting news indeed that we no longer have to rely on, on FBS. Uh, and then another question for you um, is around genetic modification. Uh, is that possible for increasing the growth rate of cells? Uh, how is genetic modification used in cultivated meat today? Um, absolutely. There are a lot of good bio biotech techniques that can be used, but I know that a lot of companies try at least to stay away from them just because of the panic in public from uh, GMOs. But uh, some might consider, especially in the US, uh, to um, you know, do some genetic modification, but it's absolutely possible to make cells grow faster. We can actually genetically modify them uh, in a way that instead of producing too much waste, they can recycle the waste and uh, use it as a nutrient. Um, so they're all absolutely possible. And I think some companies will eventually uh, do some degree of uh, modification to uh, optimize their processes. Thanks, Raz. And uh, Emma, moving over to you, um, maybe you have some thoughts on this around the fat content of cultivated meat. What can we expect that to look like? Sure. So just like conventional ground beef products, for example, 
cultivated meat products can be formulated with a wide range of fat and protein ratios. So, you know, once one might see at the supermarket, an 80, 20 ground beef or 95, five. Um, so similarly with cultivated meat, uh, there can be products that combine cultivated fat and cultivated proteins at those, at those same ratios. And then also, as we discussed a little bit earlier, there can also be products that combine cultivated fat with plant protein. Um, and we've, we've seen a couple companies, um, announce products in that vein, such as, such as, such as Mission Barnes's pork products, for example. Thanks, Emma. And um, we had a related question um, to the GMO conversation we were just having. Um, this is really around the best ways to increase consumer trust. Um, are there lessons learned from GMO stigmas that can be applied to cultivated meat in terms of ensuring consumers trust these products um, and are willing to go out and eat them? Yeah, so I think from the start, I would encourage any company um, that being direct and transparent with consumers is is the most is going to be the most effective path forward. Um, as we've discussed a lot today, consumer understanding of these products and and the quite complex technology involved is relatively low. Um, and I think there remains an enormous opportunity for consumer education. Um, and effective marketing of these products so consumers can fully understand the, the wide range of benefits they can offer. Um, in terms of, of GMO stigmas, I don't, I don't have any specific insights into, you know, ways that, that, ways that cultivated meat is similar um, or different from the GMO um, from the GMO issue in a marketing perspective. Um, but I do think that one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, that we're looking forward to as these products come to market is clearer um, and more effective market research as well that can actually act upon real consumer decisions um, as these products become available in grocery stores and at restaurants. Absolutely, that will be so important and critical. And uh, will GFI keep tabs on any fact checking um, or any marketing related language in the cultivated meat industry? Right. So GFI doesn't act as an industry watchdog for the alternative protein space. However, we do, of course, offer um, our insights into what are best practices for marketing, um, labeling, um, and talking about different alternative protein pillars. So just as we've, we've discussed how using plant-based terms um, is the most effective way to communicate about plant-based products to consumers rather than vegan or vegetarian terms, um, we will continue to do research on the cultivated meat pillar um, and provide basically a, a one-stop shop for the best consumer insights um, and marketing practices for cultivated meat as they come to market. Thanks. And, and just to add on to that earlier, we got a question around if cultivated meat companies could join GFI as paying members. And just to reiterate that we are not a trade organization. We don't have paying members. We are an international nonprofit um, trying to reimagine meat production. Um, and then I think this is a really great question too, Emma. Is anyone conducting consumer market research to better understand consumer behavior in Singapore now that people have more access to cultivated meat products there? Um, do we know anything about consumer adoption in Singapore at this point in time, or does more research need to be performed there? Right. I haven't seen much consumer market research on the current uh, products available in Singapore. Um, I totally agree. It's a great opportunity to see um, how previous findings or hypothetical findings are translating to a real life market. Um, that said, it's still a very small market in Singapore. So I think that um, it will also, I think that a lot of our questions will remain until the cultivated meat industry is able to scale up to a commercial scale um, sized industry. Absolutely. And uh, shifting back over um, to some questions for Laura and Maddie, um, someone's wondering if cultivated meat can be certified by halal religious certification bodies. Do we have any news on that front? Um, I don't 
know of any. I know there was um, a recent announcement in Israel about the fact that cultivated meat could be considered kosher in some circumstances, but that's kind of generally going to be a decision from those um, religious bodies and from those that are kind of responsible for making those decisions. So I think that's less of um, an issue for governments to decide to decide than for the religious organizations themselves to decide. Well, that's exciting about the, the kosher news and, and stay tuned for more developments um, on the halal certification. Um, and then again, another question for both of you. Uh, what does the patent landscape look like for cultivated meat? Do we anticipate litigation happening within this sector? Is there potential for cross-licensing? Um, how, are, how are you thinking or viewing that? That is an interesting question, but unfortunately it's outside of the scope of the work that our, our regulatory group within GFI currently does. So we don't have insights into that. Certainly, of course, there have been patent applications filed in this space. Thank you. And Emma, maybe you have some thoughts on this question. Are there concerns at GFI about monopolization um, of the cultivated meat industry? Are we worried that this is going to become too concentrated? I think at this point, we're still very excitingly seeing more and more startups launched each year. Um, we'll be excited to share our upcoming state of the industry reports that are launched in the spring. Um, and we have seen a continued rise in the number of cultivated meat companies that are out, out, of, out of stealth mode today. Um, and I think that one point that that, that question raises is also the, um, the benefits to the cultivated to the cultivated meat industry of, of activity from incumbents as well as startups. Um, this is a big space. The meat industry on the conventional side is worth you know, more than a trillion dollars globally. And we've yet to see but a splash in the bucket on the cultivated meat side. So I think it's, it's too early to, um, to suggest that there would be any um, risk in the near term of a monopolization of the cultivated meat industry. Thanks, Emma. Um, I think that is a wonderful note to end on. Uh, and I also just wanted to call attention, Elliot from our team put in the chat, uh, Cultivated Meat Industry Patent Tracker. So you can go ahead and check that out for anyone who might be interested in those patents. Caveat, this is not owned by GFI. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you to all of our GFI panelists for contributing your knowledge and expertise to this conversation. Just a reminder, we will be emailing you all a copy of the presentation, um, the recording of today, including all of the Q&A, and you can find all of that on GFI's YouTube channel, along with our other Business of Alt Protein monthly seminars. Um, a quick plug, next month we will be talking about developing effective partnerships. Uh, we'll have folks coming in from Kraft Heinz, Danone, um, Jividan, uh, to talk about how to partner with alt protein startups um, with larger incumbents. So stay tuned for that and hope you can join us. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.